Ireland is just the most delightful place and always seems fabulously frayed at the edges like the woman in the bar, her lipstick smudged, her nail polish chipped, but with a look of true knowing, buy her a drink and you'll be rewarded with entertaining tales of a tough life well and fabulously lived. It's been dashed by famine, finances and the struggle for independence, lashed by the most withering of weather, but Ireland simply shrugs into a layer of comfort, takes a hearty swig and finds something poetic, melodic and comedic about it all. And the visitor is the great beneficiary, able to love it and then leave it before the rising damp leaves a watermark. We're exploring Scenic's Jewels of Iberia and Ireland Cruise, one of the many dream destinations on the schedule for their new six-star discovery yacht, Scenic Eclipse, which launches early next year. Our playground is the lush green landscapes of Ireland, from Dingle here in the southwest, across to Cove, up to Waterford, and finishing up in Dublin. Just out there is Ireland's westernmost chip. In fact, step off there, you'll give Europe the slip. National Geographic called this the most beautiful place, the most beautiful place on the Earth's face. But there's fog and there's bog and there's wind and there's sleet and there are tractors hauling hay down Dingle's main street. If you were born here, they say, you'll stay, find a wife, but ask a local if he's lived here all his life, despite the cold, the mud and the wet, he's likely to reply, well, not yet. Perched on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean is the delightful town of Dingle, and at its heart is its fishing port. But despite its old world charm and colourful houses lining the waterfront, it's the famous drive around the peninsula that draws the tourists. This mountainous finger of land jutting out into the ocean is home to an intoxicating blend of breathtaking scenery and ancient archaeological wonders. There are some 2,000 odd monuments and relics like this ring fort scattered throughout the Dingle Peninsula. Origins of settlement have been dated back thousands of years and have been verified by historians, not only because the remoteness and inability to support agriculture has meant little uh, interference, but also because of the bog. Items and evidence from as far back as the Stone Age has been discovered because the bog preserves everything, even pollen, revealing the types of vegetation that would have grown here throughout thousands of years. At every turn and bend in the road is another jaw-dropping vista or monument from centuries past. And as well as having ample time to explore, Scenic gives you a night right in the town of Dingle itself. And like all good Irish towns, there's a wealth of watering holes to choose from. It's in the pubs that you discover the real lifeblood of Irish society. This is where the jokes are told, this is where the party is, this is where the music is. And I'm a big fan of Irish music, Van Morrison, Thin Lizzy. I can even stomach some of that diddly diddly stuff, <laughs> providing I've had about eight of these. Our journey with Scenic on their jewels of Iberia and Ireland cruise has landed us in the charming Irish town of Cove. In typical Irish fashion, although spelt C-O-B-H, this town is actually called Cove. Perhaps the naming ceremony took place after the celebration and it was left to a shaky official to fill in the form. It's a sleepy waterfront town. Well, it's sleepy until they crank up the bells of the cathedral's carillion. 
the largest carillion in Ireland and England, guaranteed to clear the whiskey fug from a shaky official's head. When Scenic's new six-star Discovery yacht Scenic Eclipse launches, it'll dock right here in this famous harbour. This is the second largest natural harbour in the world after Sydney Harbour and one that's been stamped with something of a trinity of tragedy. This was the embarkation point for thousands of convicts transported to Australia. It was the embarkation point for 2.5 million Irish fleeing to the US to escape the ravages of the potato famine and it was the final port of call for the Titanic. Oh, and this is the pier. Exactly, yeah, this is the pier, Heartbreak Pier. Right. Okay. So this is the original pier that's there since 1912. And it was called Heartbreak Pier because obviously mostly it would have been third class passengers who would have left from here. And third class passengers leaving on a boat were generally going to America. So they had to say goodbye to their friends, families and loved ones for the very last time. This was the embarkation point for 123 passengers of the Titanic. Of those, 44 survived its sinking. This museum now stands to honour those that succumbed to the icy waters and to give an insight into the fateful maiden voyage of the RMS Titanic. As well as hearing the story from the point of view of the passengers, the Titanic experience houses replicas of first and third class cabins, which were actually quite palatial for the time. So included in the ticket price, which was £8, there was your blanket, sheets and pillows for the bed, whereas on other liners you were expected to bring your own. Mm. And they did have running water in their room with a little basin and they had electricity when most people didn't have running water or electricity in their own homes. With the country's history of hardships, it's no surprise the Irish love a tipple. And when it comes to a national drink, it's a tight tussle between their beloved Guinness and their love of Irish whisky. George Bernard Shaw said, whisky is liquid sunshine. James Joyce said, the light music of whisky falling into a glass, an agreeable interlude. W.C. Field said, always carry a flagon of whisky in case of snake bite. Furthermore, always carry a small snake. Why is it that actors, musicians and writers are so seduced by whisky? Just a half hour drive from Cove on the outskirts of Cork is the Jamison Experience. Though it closed its doors back in 1975, the old distillery has been beautifully preserved with some of its original buildings dating back as far as the late 1700s. This is the water wheel over here. And this is driven by the river? By the water power, yeah, exactly. And it was powering the whole distillery up until 1975 when it closed. These days, there's a new modern distillery at the back of the complex. There's no comparison to the charm of the original. Wow! Yeah. That is a monster still. Yeah, this is the largest one in the world. It can hold 32,000 gallons or 144,000 litres. It's beautiful, isn't it? It is, isn't it? <laughs> so a fire was lit underneath. That fire below this pot still would have used four tonnes of coal every 24 hours. Goodness gracious. Yeah. Naturally, a tasting is all part of the experience. And I've been given the daunting task of comparing Irish, Scotch and Bourbon whiskies. First up, of course, the Irish. Mmm. That is smooth and yeah. vanilla-y. Yeah. yeah, you get the sweetness on it, yeah. yeah. The Scotch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not as smooth. Not as smooth, no. The Scotch is not as smooth as the Irish. <laughs> You'd be happy to hear that. I'm uh, very happy to hear it. And the bourbon. Very creamy. Ooh, yeah! Well... <laughs> Jamison's. Best. Is the one. Delighted to hear that. 
1171, the largely disliked King Henry sailed up the river shore here, Europe's fastest flowing river, passing the Hook Peninsula on his right and the small village of Crook on his left, vowing to reach Waterford by hook or by crook, thus coining the phrase. Established as a settlement by the Vikings back in the 900s, Waterford is Ireland's oldest city, and although it was a land-grabbing, tax-collecting, fair-maiden seducing conquest of Henry's, can you imagine, he must have discovered one hell of a charming Irish village. Waterford sits on the Shore River in the far east of the country, home to one of Ireland's major shipping ports. But the city's most recognisable landmark is its 13th century tower, built on the site of an old Viking fort. A wealth of other historic treasures from centuries past are housed nearby in the city's medieval museum. And these are original documents? Yeah. From when? The first one is 1171. And what are they exactly? This first one here was given to us in 1171 by King Henry II, making this the very first royal city in Ireland. So basically these are about trade. This, this document was compiled together. These were all separate until 1372. The exhibits themselves are a feast for both the eyes and the imagination. This is King Henry VIII's actual sword from 1536, given to William Wise, the Waterford ambassador at the royal court, for doing the King's Highness his most diligent service. This rich royal history gave rise to what remains Waterford's most glistening tourist attraction. It's a miracle of light and heat and art, but a fine line between shimmer and shatter. Waterford Crystal has been manufactured here since 1783, and in its heyday, every day, two tons of molten glass would be shaped into shining, sparkling objects of desire and shipped around the world. All that was needed, glass, a furnace of 1400 degrees, a mold able to handle the heat, and the skilled lips of an artisan. On its own, the showroom is spectacular, but a behind-the-scenes tour will give you an even greater appreciation for these hand-blown works of art. How long do these guys work to reach this level? To qualify as a master craftsman, you're working for about eight years. Your apprenticeship is five years. After that, you're qualified. So after five years, you're given a test. And if you pass the test, you continue on training for three more years wow. than your master craftsman. This here is the engine room of the entire business. This is hot, hard, high concentration work. It has to be at a high enough temperature to keep it pliable. Um, other than that, it's just going to be it's too hard to shape and it'll just, they'll have to recycle it, it won't be good enough. So I was thinking that the guys that blew it did the whole thing, but there's another department altogether. Completely different department, so it's eight more years to become a master here. So it's a full career, isn't it? It's a full career, and they're all here from a very young age. Right. To finish a grand journey such as scenic jewels of Iberia and island adventure, one needs a suitably fabulous final destination. And Dublin fits that bill superbly. The compact and charming capital is a fusion of past and present, from its centuries-old Georgian architecture to its lively watering holes and, of course, its homage to the country's favourite ale. If you ever thought the importance of Guinness to Ireland and Ireland's dependency on it was a myth, you only need to come here to Dublin to realise it's not. The city centre is dominated by the massive Guinness complex. It is indeed the thumping heart from which pumps the rich, thick, creamy, velvety, chocolatey lifeblood of the nation. Created by Arthur Guinness, this legendary liquor has become one of the most popular beers in the world. And this here is its spiritual home. 
This seven-storey emporium is chock full of historic exhibitions, tasting rooms, and of course, a rooftop bar. Over the centuries, Dublin has been a hub for artists, writers and academics, many of whom now form the famous alumni of Trinity College, one of the oldest and most esteemed institutions on the planet. Trinity College is steeped in tradition and superstition, one of those traditions being the student's right to a pint of stout during exams. Now, if the student exercises that right, the college exercises its right to fine that student for not wearing a sword. It is Ireland after all. The other superstition they have is that no student will walk through the arches of the Campanile here if the bells are tolling. They believe that they'll fail their exams if they do. Trinity's biggest treasure is the Long Room Library, both for its magnificence as a building and as home to every book published in Ireland and the UK since the 1600s. And the building itself? Well, this building, this library here, this began around about 1712. It was completed about 1723. But they had so many books here. It used to have a flat ceiling on it, and they had so many books here that they had to extend it. So this beautiful vaulted ceiling we're looking at now, this was built in the 1860s. A short walk from Trinity College is Dublin's main green escape, St Stephen's Green. The Lord Mayor of Dublin has the right to bestow on anyone considered to have made a significant contribution to the City of Dublin, the Freedom of Dublin Award. The award grants the recipient certain rights, one of them being the right to pass to sheep on any common ground found within the boundaries of the city. In 2000, that well-known shepherd Bono of U2 promptly rounded up a flock and brought them here to graze. Just across from the park is our luxury hotel. Rest assured, Scenic will have you booked in at the best five-star address in town. At almost 200 years old, the Shelburne is the grand old dame of Dublin's high-end hotel scene. This timeless landmark is an Irish institution and a mighty fine establishment. And while the bar here will more than satisfy your thirst, within a short walk you'll find a wealth of other local pubs and bars. But possibly the most iconic watering hole of all, the Brazen Head, the city's oldest pub, dating back to 1198, is still serving pints to this day. Why was it built here? We believe probably this is the oldest part of the city and this is where the first bridge was built in the city. And so Dublin got its name from the bridge that was built here. So this would be the perfect stop for people entering yeah, the city, visiting exactly, the city. Exactly, nice watering hole. Right. But what was, what was the pub like in your student days? In my days, there wasn't enough tables and we used to come in here, you'd put your drink down on the floor, there was lino on the floor, there was holes in the floor and your drink would often disappear. Right. It was that kind of place. Right. Yeah, it was and it's fantastic. Nobody lives life like the Irish. They realise life is a serious transaction, but they are determined that enjoyment will polish all struggles. And there's a similar paradox going on with the landscape. It is God-forsaken and bleak, but it's magnificent and spectacular because of it. Ireland is religious, it's raucous, it's ravaged, it's ravishing, it's wild and it's peaceful. They say Ireland is where the angels come to fold their wings and rest, but they better rest fast because you soon realise in Ireland there's always a party that's about to start next door.